related to the provision of assistance. This isn't formalised in legal policy. This isn't formalised, this isn't in, captured in traditional codes of conduct like the Chabab Sray. This is an approach that is embodied and performed. This approach basically means that when a girl is rejected and brutalized and hurt and she goes to a shelter, at the shelter, she has someone who opens the door to her and says, you're welcome here, you know, you're accepted for your rights, for who you are. You have unique skills and abilities that are worthwhile. We want to invest in you. We think you can be something. This is awesome stuff, right? This is particularly awesome stuff in a modern urban individualistic environment, right? This is the basis of how we get our identity, how we come to play our roles with confidence in the world, in, in, in a more modern individualistic world. The challenge, of course, is that when people come from traditional collectivistic rural environments over here and they come to the shelter and we welcome them in, we don't honor them on behalf of their role, not their traditional role, we, we, sh we show them respect and we show them love and we show them esteem on the basis of modern values that inform our work. This is professional social work driven stuff, you know, this is the basics. We want them to have personal autonomy, develop themselves. The challenge, of course, is that after you've given them all of that, you can't then send them back and expect to be satisfied with being honored for their traditional roles. So it's complicated. Um, so we're good, you know, in, in some of these well-funded places that I've seen, you know, we are good at empowering people in this modern sense. And it's, it, it's a part of us, it's who we are, and we're training people who come and work with us to be this way. You know, these modern values are influencing what we're doing. These modern values, we celebrate and love and cherish them, and they're good in rights mainstreaming and gender mainstreaming, activities that aim to change the country broadly. Many people support these ideas and their dissemination. However, when we are helping an individual, these ideas can do damage in one individual's life, right? We can do damage unintentionally. My take on it is that if she's got nothing to go back to because she's not accepted, she's rejected, she's got nothing, there's no honor, there's no love, she's a bad girl and she's vulnerable to more abuse, if that's her situation, absolutely, embrace her, accept her, bring her in, provide her care in full knowledge that the care you're providing is preparing her for life in the modern world. Through, through support, through the right kind of support, she can develop the right emotional <coughs> reflexivity to be able to return to the traditional environment for a short time, play her role for a short time. She's role playing, you know, she knows I'm being a good girl, doing this thing with mum and dad. I can do this for about two days, but by the time I have to go home, by the, you know, I'm looking forward to going home to be myself again, to be free, to see my friends who recognize and acknowledge me. And, you know, we're good at that. We're good at that, which is something. I've talked about two reintegrative pathways today. The first one, let's talk about modern, the first one in modern life, it really lines up with a social philosopher called Axel Honneth, the German social philosopher. And basically modern integration within modern social life in Cambodia looks a lot like integration within modern individualistic societies more generally. These ideas and, are influencing social relations, not in full, but in part. The other more traditional pathway it, it reflects, it sort of draws on work done by Judy Ledgerwood. It reflects, she's theorized how traditional societies work. What a, a successful traditional woman looks like. People, you know, I won't get into, the, in, into that debates, but essentially the main message that, that I'm bringing and, and what I've seen in the data and it resonates with other research that I've drawn on is that there's, there's sort of two general pathways to social integration within modern and within traditional, within individualistic, within collectivistic, within urban, within rural. Uh, there's my email. I'm uh, very open to questions now. 
uh, at FCC afterwards uh, by email. Um, and again, my appreciation to the non-identified organizations who gave so much over a 20-month period where I drove all over the country to see people wherever they happened to be reintegrated from this list. It was a long process with a lot of support from people doing very, very hard work because reintegration assistance is very hard to provide. <laughs> um, and when I hear people say, I reintegrated 5,000 5, children from orphanages because I closed them all down. We sent them home. <laughs> It, it makes me a bit upset. <laughs> okay, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Q and A. Q and A. Please, can I get a seat? <laughs> <laughs> and it was snowing where I was oh, coming yeah, from, so I'm sorry I'm so wet. <laughs> It doesn't have to be Q&A. <laughs> okay. well, I came much too late, sorry for that. But I'm wondering, I made you talk before, then I can ask him also. Please speak up. But how is the family involved in the reintegration process? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So how is the family involved in the reintegration process? Um, according to all different sort of standards and procedures that are adopted by different organisations. Some organisations make this a big priority, others don't so much. Um, that's the short answer. Yeah. In, in theory, if we could bring families along a journey embracing those modern values, right? That's a way to go. That's intensive work. It's really super intensive work and it might only work for some and not others depending on the cultural environment. A great question. Yeah, but I think when, you, when you're talking about a traditional way of living and a modern way of living, then you are talking about a culture of Cambodia and they're making a step forward. So, and even maybe the mothers of the girls who had this experience have the same experience, so they, though maybe they know where to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think you're right that we have. There's parts of tra Cambodia that are very traditional, but there's also parts that are super modern. They whiz by me on motorbikes and pinch my phone sometimes, and you know, <laughs> you know, we have all, we have both ends of the spectrum. So, thanks. Next one. Um. In terms of the two pathways, um, yep. have you seen success here in Cambodia and what does that look like? Thank you, great question. Uh, I didn't see a lot of traditional success. I saw some who were really doing well in a really traditional environment. But there was something there nagging. And you know that nagging thing was the question of their sexual reputation. Even you know, one of the girls, she married the perpetrator who was the husband, became the husband later, obviously. And, and this was something that, you know, it was a rape case that was taken, but they were lovers, and we could talk about consent all night. But in the end, she chose to marry him after going to the shelter, after getting all of this great stuff. But this was the part she chose to go back to the village. And back in the village, um, she, I mean, she looked successful, right? She had a, a, a two children, you know, she was only, all of 19 or 20 or something, it's pretty young to be having children, but her family, she was with her family, she had a husband, she, um, was, she'd was she been trained to sew things and sell them locally, it looks great, but over the course of like an hour and a half interview, it was even a bit longer, she so it sort of came out that there's still problems with the, the this other girl who wanted to marry him, and his other husband is, made, it's, it's kind of like, is the relationship stable? Is she gonna get, turfed out again because people still don't think she's good so okay that's traditional so I didn't see much great traditional success right what I did see was some radically transformed girls or about six or seven who describe themselves as reborn or living again because the, the, the experience of being loved and accepted is it it creates life right it, it, it 
it rebirths you. Um, yeah, and, and they, they had that in spades, some of them. Others of them, even more tragic, right, is the ones who had that, they had all this stuff in the shelter. They came to value themselves again. Oh, incredible. But when they got out, there were no social groups or institutions who could reflect that value back to them. The only place they ever found it was in the shelter. And out in real life, nothing. You know, from the, the mum who ran the casino, the guy who used to be her pimp, and um, her, all her cousins and whatever who think of her as a prostitute. She thought she might have a job with them working in bridal industry, but they all treated terribly. So, like, they need social groups to connect into. You need other people. This acceptance in the data looks like mutual recognition in theory. These ideas of mutual recognition, that we recognize each other, and on the basis of that, we are able to experience freedom within modern life, right? Next question, please. Oh, sorry, Jay, you want to say something else? Go. Yeah. Um, so from that, that then give you a better idea of procedural success looks like. Procedural success, what does it look like? Yeah, well, within, I mean, are they loved within families or intimate friendships? Do they have those opportunities within the workplace? Do they have work? Can they get work within the workplace? Are they able to be recogni recognized and esteemed for what they're doing? Um, have they embodied these ideas of rights and self-respect that enable them to feel confident to do their jobs or to stand next to someone in line or to whatever, participate as a citizen? So, Sorry, David was next. David was next. Sorry. <laughs> and then, then I'll defer to Sharon. Look, thanks so much for the, for the presentation. What I loved about it was the passion that you brought to it. <laughs> and it's clearly a game. Yes, it's inevitable. It comes with a doing a PhD. But what I love is that the, the passion persists. So and that was wonderful to see. I've got a, a kind of an academic question. And you talked about the beginning that the participants that you identified had been or the participants had identified, been identified as successfully reintegrated. Mm. And it was this, they themselves identified as being successfully reintegrated, or was this the perceptions of the NGOs that they were su successfully reintegrated? Because that, that begs the question a little bit. Great question. Great question. Everyone is making up reintegration and their ways to assess it. Everyone has a different idea. There are some ideas that are more predominant than others. I think. If we're going to set up procedures, we need to take note of what's happening in social reality and design our boxes to fit how it works in social reality. Um, so, yes, the organisations identified them as successful. I never gave any criteria because this is the point. I want to find out what other people think. Um, and they, it was, uh, there were some who I would agree with. Yeah, they were successful. There were others who were so sad, honestly. Some of the cases were really difficult. Um, yeah, please. So in the study, you've taken your sample from the four successful NGOs, but you mentioned there might be as many as 100 different shelters. I wonder if you have any sense of the extent to which the different pathways are being employed intentionally or otherwise by the other 96 yeah. that, that, that you didn't look at. Now, yeah. obviously, it goes beyond your data, yes, yeah. but it's a big question. What are all the others doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah great, great question. Um, I, I, I get the sense that it's a mishmash, um, and that's intuition based on time living in country. But um, I get the sense that we've got traditional ideas informing what we do, we've got modern ideas informing what we do, and they all get washed together in the mix. Um, which is dangerous, as says Sarah, my wife here, who was managing Hagar for a while and um, saw the difficulties of reintegration work firsthand. <laughs> Thank you very much, Luke, uh, for that very inspiring presentation. Um, I was just uh, wondering, I mean, um, I think the sample for this research was uh, the girls uh, from seven to 12. Is it right? Uh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, 18 to 25. Uh, sorry. At but, the time of interview. Okay, yeah. But one of the gaps in this region, as you know, is the 
you know, that the um, intervention towards the male victim is really lacking. So I'm just uh, wondering, I mean, maybe uh, during your research data collection, you probably came up with some of the um, cases uh, of male victims. And do you really see the um, pathway of reintegration? Do you see basically similar or? Great question. I was at a wedding last night with Aya. Um, I was sitting next to a girl who'd done research on integration with uh, people who've been trafficked for fishing guys. Her name's Kate. Kate Kate Day. It was interesting chatting with her because, I mean, for guys, I mean, I haven't done a lot of work on what, how guys, the traditional things associated with male roles, right? Most of my work has been on the female side. I, I do have some, anyway, her perspective on that when we were chatting is that for men, they don't have any role or any place. If they don't have a family with wealth, then they want to have a family, right? They, they, they most, most want to have a family, but there's no pathway to getting a family if there's no job. If there's no job, there's no way to establish an identity for them at all. So forget trying to provide assistance to them because as soon as they come, they're gone to the next place to try and get the next job. It's so hard because they're, they're just on the search. So whereas, yeah, that's a comment. Yeah, needs, needs research. So you talked about the importance of having, um, in the modern setting, having the relationships being built up. And clearly the, a, a larger number of relationships are going to help in terms of stability in case people move on. Did you come across organizations or settings where that was being facilitated by any of the organizations or, or things that would help uh, to facilitate that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there were very different approaches among some of the organisations. Um, one of them, sort of, their process of providing assistance seemed to go on for a very long time, in that they would just keep following up, keep following up, keep following. Everyone else would do it for twelve or twenty-four, but they would institutionally, they just their list kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, perhaps not a sustainable, desirable model from a donor's perspective, but from the girl's perspective, at least they had someone coming to see them. Whether that makes for a real sense of community and real integration is another matter. Um, the next answer to your question is that within there were two faith-based organisations who participated and two who weren't faith-based. Now the faith-based organisations, you are trying, you are confronted with people who've been rejected and excluded. They don't have anything. There's a tendency to draw on what resources you, whatever you have, to help this person fill their gap, to help them feel accepted and included and special, right? within the faith-based organizations, typically the people working there had associations with churches and youth groups and whatever. And so for the girls, they would often connect themselves with sort of youth group activities or church activities or something, and they would find connection and a place, and, and also through social enterprises was critical. Um, social enterprises, these church sort of youth group kind of things, these, these provided a means for the continuing attachments with other people, you know? Um, yeah, that's the main thing. Social enterprises, some people are do doing it really, really well, you know? Um, and that's a huge, I mean, that's a great thing. If you can get a community around that, um, and I saw a bit of that, yeah. Thank you, Luke. Um, you mentioned that social exclusion and rejection seems to be a, a primary problem. So when we read the newspapers that a young uh, girl or woman's been raped um, at the village level, and then she is taken and put into the shelter, are we not saying there is something bad about her when the perpetrator stays in the village? And is that, is that ever challenged? Yeah, it's a great question. So the question to repeat it is, this will give me time to think, <laughs> um, when, when, we're, when a girl has been raped in a village, and, and typically, I mean, through the research, when she's been raped in a village, has, um, and, and we remove her and put her in a shelter, is that not letting the perpetrator off the hook and blaming her? Okay, that's sort of the question. Um, what I can say is the pathway of these girls to the shelter was typically 
These are not victims. This is important. And there's a lot of the research I haven't had time to stress. These are not victims in the sense that we tend to portray them. These were people fighting to be honoured and respected as Khmer women. Well, let's not say respected, fighting to be honoured as Khmer women. They had had their dignity trampled on by someone else and they saw themselves as good Khmer women. How can someone do this to me? I'm not a bad girl. I'm not that. I am... They would fight it. They would fight it at the local level with the village chief. That was, first of all, the families, the parents would try and work it out with the perpetrator, the village chief, then the commune, then the district level. Eventually, someone will get involved with the police and the referral to the NGO. But at no stage do I see her in, in this, as, a, as a victim in that traditional sense. She is fighting for her recognition. The problem is, when you're fighting for recognition as being a good Khmer woman, it isn't clear how you can be that once, once you've experienced sexual violence in, this, in, in a traditional culture. It's, it's like, you know, it goes back to the cliche, right? The, the, the spoiled, you know, the white cloth once dropped on the ground is spoiled, right? Yeah, it, it, it's a cliche, but that's, it comes back to that, really. Men are gold, women are cloth. If your cloth is dropped on the ground, then it's once stained, it's hard to clean it again. Um, so, this is, this is hard though, right? Because we want to promote these rights. We want to, we want to get the perpetrator. We want to, you know, but you've got these tensions with, you know, balancing. Gee, I mean, these girls, most of them, they really couldn't stay. It's not for what I was seeing. And again, I'm working with pretty good organizations. They're not really having this stuff imposed on them. And some of them left earlier than what they were told. And they got in trouble and had difficulties because of it. They wanted and out because being there was unbearable for their families and for themselves. The honor, the dishonor and disrespect was unbearable, intolerable, all of the talk drove them insane. Thanks for your presentation, Luke. Really, really interesting. Um, maybe a provocative question. I'm interested in your advice for practitioners, mm. and I'm interested specifically in what you were saying before about how um, there's a greater ease potentially in finding community when women are attached to faith-based mm. service providers. Mm. I'm wondering if your message is that it's actually harder to deliver an effective service if you're not <laughs> no, no, that's not my message. <laughs> but thanks for the question. Um, sorry, what was the first part? The first part, I, I got laughing and I forget what you, you started with there. You advised practitioners. Advised practitioners, that's right. Thank you. This gives me a chance to say something important. Um, which is that um, the practitioners are the ones who are giving advice to me that I'm trying to share with you, really. Do you know what I mean? They are not being led by these juridical legal conceptions of reintegration. You know, they're being influenced by traditional ideas. That's affecting some of the service delivery. But really, what I see emerging from the field is an inspirational idea of justice. <laughs> reintegration, what's the emphasis? It's about each other. It's about us participating in social groups and communities. It reminds us that rights on their own are not enough. Rights goes beyond it goes into social life. It, 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 it's justice is dependent upon um, our interactions with people and the social norms that guide those interactions. And, and I'm drawing from Axel Honneth there when I speak about that. But justice, yeah, this idea of integration is coming from the field, the emphasis on it. It's a little bit confused coming from the field because sometimes we're thinking traditional, sometimes we're thinking sort of modern. We, we don't, you know, it's, it, hasn't, it hasn't been clarified so well. But the emphasis, the practitioners know it's about, you know, sometimes they might talk about belonging or they talk about love or, you know, they, they talk about, I, I remember when I used to do child protection work in, in Melbourne, we would say to each other with the hardest kids we had, you know, because the harder they get, the more money you've got to look after them, right? And the, the, we've got all the money. We could give them anything in the world, but nothing that they need, you know? All of the money and everything you splash at it is, is not going to fix it. All of the things, even skills and abilities, you can give them skills and abilities on their own, that's not enough. They need people, groups and institutions to welcome them in where they can 
recognise that and be recognised. You just touched on the idea of throwing money at a problem. And it's not a luxury that we have in Cambodia or in many countries these days, economic recessions. So probably a leap of faith beyond the research, but given these constrained economic times, and given that organizations who are working in reintegration have got to be smarter, more efficient, provide greater value for money, is there any broad advice that you, you can give to them as to how to fine tune or refine their programs? You know, given the limited money, where would it best be spent? It's a really good question. With the most difficult cases, and that's what this research focused on, it's really hard to do anything cheap. Yeah. People who are brutalized are, are completely brutalized. And that's why they need so much help. Yeah. Um, with other sort of levels of care, you know, there's not as much need for the intensity. But at the most intense end, it's it, it's it's resource expensive. It's difficult. Um, yeah. How's, how would money be well spent? Um, <laughs> I mean, for me, I'm obviously interested in seeing us look at what's going on and how social integration is achieved and develop benchmarks related to that. Um, that's a good place, rather than just doing what we think. Um, I mean, the other, I mean, neoliberal sort of agenda would have us put more emphasis on communities anyway, right? So this is a popular idea of having the communities take more responsibility rather than institutions. Um, but, I mean, there is evidence that people live in communities, so, you know, they can't live in institutions. So, yeah, there, there's definitely, there's place for investment in the right ways to uh, achieve better outcomes. So can I build on that one and ask, in your research with the organisations, did you find any that, uh, you, you talked about one that s almost stayed with the, the uh, beneficiary all the way through, repeatedly visited them. But do you find any at the opposite end of the spectrum which were doing this in a relatively short space of time and quite smartly, uh, for instance, by sequencing things more tightly or involving the family at an earlier stage or doing anything like that to actually make this a shorter, perhaps even a cheaper process? Yeah. Thank you. It's a good question. I was working with organisations who were doing mostly intensive work, it wasn't really quick and um, th th there are um, some groups I've heard of who um, they're, they're kind of, their approach is less resource intensive immediately following and they're just trying to put, when, when a, this is specific to situations of rape um, within a community, just trying to put the minimum in um, to support their family to get through it without sort of bringing a whole lot of cultural baggage and counselling and everything from Western ideas, right? But just trying to minimally support that. That is, I mean, for me, that probably makes a bit of sense because you got, if, if she can be accepted back, if, if people don't know, that's the best thing, she's going to be okay if she can individually get through it, yeah? Um, yeah, it is, it, it's tricky. It, it, it's tricky. Case by case, case by case. Individual, yeah, yeah. Don't feel rude if you're leaving, please. <laughs> I'm sick of me. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. They rang up quite a lot of bells. For me, I managed a young people service in England in the north in a northern city in England and there is a national trafficking of indigenous young girls who perhaps wouldn't be considered the bonniest lass, you know, not the, the best looking girl at school. And we're talking very young kids here. Um, because the people who are perpetrating the internal 
trafficker, you know, driving these kids to other cities, mm. you know, in the Midlands, wherever, mm. um, for, well, to have, uh, to do what, <laughs> you know, obviously. And these kids, you know, you look at these young women, and you think, crikey, you know, their self-esteem is so low that actually they're, you know, stood there with this beautiful young non-indigenous man saying he loves her very, very much and he's topping up her phone and, you know, he's giving her bits and bobs in the way of gifts and then he's, you know, taking photographs and once photographs are taken, it's so out there the rest of that universe is like shockingly, shockingly so. So it's very much about um, two things really, I think. One, the youth services were talking about this for two years, loud and clear, for two years prior to anything being done about it. And that was because there was an anxiety of possibly being seen as racist, mm. you know? So it was a hot potato, not everybody wanted to touch. Um, and I just wonder if there, there's been any constraints around that. And the response was, two years too late, um, but was, you know, a big crackdown, and a lot of these guys were picked up along with their friends, and, you know, all the mapping was done of the different cities they'd made, you know, in Rosat within Britain. Um, and, you know, it's not just a page where you know, problem, mm. you know, it's young women feeling uncared for and unappreciated and 